In this chapter, we will quickly review some key numerical measures of data, another essential part of descriptive statistics. The numerical measures introduced in this chapter include location, dispersion, shape, and association. Once again, this video does not provide much detail. If you are not familiar with these concepts, please read the book carefully or consider taking a solid undergrad stat course. Let's first introduce some key concepts. Sample statistics are numerical measures computed for data from a sample. Population parameters, on the other hand, are numerical measures computed for data from a population. In addition, a sample statistic is also called as the point estimator of the corresponding population parameter in statistical inference. Now, we will take a look at measures of location. Mean, or average value, is computed by summing the data values and dividing by the number of observations. Mean provides a measure of the central location for the data. There are a few other means. Here, we introduce weighted mean and geometric mean. Weighted mean is obtained by assigning each observation a weight that reflects its importance. Geometric mean is calculated by finding the nth root of the product of n values. Medium is another important measure of central location of data. It is the value in the middle when the data are arranged in ascending order. That is, if there are odd number of observations, the medium is the middle value. If there are even number of observations, the median is the average of the two middle values. Mode is another measure of location, which is the value that occurs with greatest frequency. You probably realize that a data set may have more than one mode. If the data have exactly one mode, we say the data are unimodal. If the data have exactly two modes, the data are bimodal. If the data have three or more modes, they are called multimodal. Percentile describes how the data are spread over the interval from the smallest value to the largest value. According to the textbook, if we say x is the pth percentile, then at least p percent of the observations are less than or equal to x, and at least 100 minus p percent of the observations are greater than or equal to x. And the 50th percentile is just the median. This definition is questionable. Suppose we have four numbers, 10, 20, 30, and 40. The question is, is 20 the 25th percentile or the 50th percentile? The trouble is, there are at least 50% of the observations less than or equal to 20. On the other hand, there are at least 75% of the observations greater than or equal to 20. So practically, p percentile x means that approximately p percent of the observations are less than or equal to x. When the number of observations in the data set is huge, it becomes much lesser of a concern. Let's see how MS Excel and some other statistical software packages compute percentile. First, all numbers are ranked in ascending order from the smallest to the largest. Then, the location of pth percentile is given by p times m plus 1 divided by 100. Based on that, we can compute the pth percentile. Suppose we want to compute the 30th percentile of our list of four numbers 10 through 40. Here, n is equal to 4, so the location of the 30th percentile is 30 times 5 divided by 100, which is equal to 1.5.
the third is percentile will then be equal to 10 plus 0.5 times 20 minus 10, which is 15. Similarly, if you want 25th percentile, it will be equal to 12.5. Zeroth and hundredth percentiles can be defined, but they are trivial. We will simply ignore them. People often like to have data set evenly divided into four parts. Thus comes the concept of quartiles. We usually look at the first, second, and third quartiles, or Q1, Q2, and Q3. Zeroth and fourth quartile are trivial, just like zeroth and hundredth percentile. First quartile is nothing but 25th percentile, and second quartile is 50th percentile or median, and third quartile is 75th percentile. Now, let's turn our attention to measures of variability or dispersion. The simplest measure is range, which is given by the difference between the largest and the smallest values in the data set. A weakness of using range to measure variability is that it is highly sensitive to extreme values. To overcome that, people sometimes use IQR or interquartile range to measure dispersion. IQR is the difference between the third and the first quartiles. A more popular measure of variability is variance, because it utilizes all the data. The formulas are provided here. We must differentiate population variance from sample variance. One key difference is mu versus x bar. Conventionally, mu is used to denote population mean and x bar sample mean. Similarly, sigma square is population variance and s square is sample variance. xi minus mu or x bar is sometimes called deviation from the mean, whether it is population mean or sample mean. The numerator is sum of squared deviations. The other key difference is the denominator in the formulas n versus m minus 1, where n is the size of data set. Technically, the denominator in the variance formula is the degree of freedom of the data. When it is about a population, the degree of freedom is n. When it is about a sample, the degree of freedom is m minus 1. Here, I'm just going to provide a simple and hopefully understandable explanation to degree of freedom. We will see much more about degree of freedom in future topics such as ANOVA and regression analysis. When coping with a sample, we usually don't know the population mean. Otherwise, we would use population mean mu instead of sample mean x bar in the formula. Therefore, x bar, the sample mean, is used to estimate the unknown population mean. As a result, if we know m minus 1 values in a data set, we can easily find the nth or the last value in the data. This is because we know sample mean x bar, which is the average of all n values in the data. So we say that we have freedom to choose n minus 1 values. That is where the name degree of freedom came from. Sometimes we may also say that we lose one degree of freedom for estimating the population mean. One weakness of variance is that extreme values have much larger effect on variance due to the square. That's why sometimes people use absolute deviation rather than squared deviation. But there are some technical challenges when we use absolute deviation to measure variability. That's why we don't see it is used very often. So we will just focus on squared deviation and many other measures derived from it. Another weakness is that the unit of variance is squared unit of data values. For example, if data values are prices in dollar amount, the unit of variance will then be dollar squared, which doesn't make much practical sense. Consequently, an even more popular measure of variability 
is standard deviation, which is simply the positive square root of variance. Population standard deviation is the square root of population variance conventionally denoted by sigma, and sample standard deviation is square root of sample variance conventionally denoted by s. Standard deviation would then be measured in the same units as the original data. In our previous example, the unit of variance is dollar squared, so the unit of standard deviation is just a dollar, and this makes comparison of standard deviation with the mean in other statistics much easier. But one weakness of standard deviation is that it measures absolute variation. Let's explain it with an example. Suppose there are two companies A and B. Both companies have a standard deviation of $1 million in annual profit. Can we say both companies have the same variability in profitability? Or can we say that both companies are equally stable or consistent in profitability? Now let's say company A averages $10 million in profit annually, and company B's average annual profit is $100 million. We can tell immediately that company A's business is much more risky than company B. To quantify that, we introduce the concept of coefficient of variation. It is defined as the ratio of standard deviation over mean. Coefficient of variation thus provides a relative measure of variability. Skewness is often used to measure the shape of a distribution. Qualitatively, we can observe the skewness of a distribution from a graph such as histogram. Skewness essentially describes how symmetric or asymmetric the distribution is. If data are skewed to the left, the skewness is negative, and typically the mean will be greater than median. On the other hand, if data are skewed to the right, the skewness is positive, and the mean will typically be less than the median. Of course, if a distribution is symmetric, the mean is equal to the median. However, the reverse is not necessarily true. Here, we will not provide technical details about skewness Computation of it is usually done with software packages. To measure the relative location of values within a data set, we usually use z-scores or z-values. Sometimes it is also called standardized value. Z-score is computed by the deviation from the mean divided by standard deviation. In other words, z-score describes how many standard deviations a value is away from the mean. One misconception I've observed is that some students think these scores are only associated with normal distributions. I'd like to point out that these scores can be calculated for any distribution. For any z-value greater than 1, Chebyshev's theorem has shown that at least 1 minus 1 over z squared of the data values must be within z standard deviations of the mean. This is true for any distribution. More specifically, at least 75% of the data values must be within two standard deviations of the mean. At least 89% of the data values must be within three standard deviations of the mean. And at least 94% of the data values must be within four standard deviations of the mean. If we are working with bell-shaped normal distributions, aka Gaussian distributions, we have something more accurate, called empirical rule. The empirical rule says that for a normal distribution, approximately 68% of the data values are within one standard deviation of the mean, approximately 95% of the data values are within two standard deviations of the mean, and approximately 99.73% of the data values are within three standard deviations of the mean. IQRs and z-scores are sometimes used to help us identify outliers. Outliers are extreme values in the data. 
they can be unusually large or small. When using this score, we usually say that values beyond three sigma or three standard deviations of the mean are possibly outliers. When using IQR, we usually say that values that are 1.5 IQR below first quartile or 1.5 IQR above third quartile are possibly outliers. One caution is that do not simply discard values you believe are outliers. In many cases, unusually large or small values are legitimate. We can discard an outlier only if we can verify that it is caused by an error, such as the value is recorded incorrectly. Box plot is a very useful and helpful tool for summarizing statistics and identifying some characteristics of a data set. Box plot usually includes smallest and largest values as well as first, second, and third quartiles. The figure here shows how a typical box plot looks like. Now, let's discuss two measures of association between two variables x and y. These two measures are covariance and Pearson correlation coefficient. The formulas are listed here, and we consider both population and sample. Both measures provide a quantitative description of linear association between variables x and y. If covariance between x and y is positive, it indicates a positive linear association between x and y. Put it differently, when x tends to be greater than its mean, then y also tends to be greater than its mean, vice versa. Or even simpler, when x increases, y also increases. Similarly, a negative covariance indicates a negative linear association between x and y. Just like variance, covariance measure absolute association between x and y, which is not very informative. An often used related measure of association is Pearson correlation coefficient. It is defined as covariance over the product of standard deviations of x and y. Similarly, if the correlation coefficient is positive, there is positive linear association between x and y, and if the correlation coefficient is negative, there is negative linear association between x and y, but the correlation coefficient reveals more information. It can be shown that Pearson correlation coefficient must be between negative 1 and positive 1, and the larger the absolute value of the correlation coefficient is, the stronger the linear association between x and y is. When correlation coefficient is 1, there is perfect positive linear relationship between x and y. When correlation coefficient is negative 1, there is perfect negative linear relationship between x and y. And when correlation coefficient is 0, there is no linear relationship between x and y. Just want to remind you, 0 correlation coefficient implies no linear relationship. It does not say that x and y are not associated. As a matter of fact, if y is equal to x squared, we can easily show that the Pearson correlation coefficient between x and y is zero. That is, there's no linear relationship or association between x and y, but x and y have a perfect quadratic relationship.